Zombie Science Part 4. We've been looking at the book Zombie Science by Jonathan Wells. Uh, it's entitled More Icons of Evolution. The last few weeks we've covered all of the icons of evolution that were originally covered. And then one extra one, the uh, myth of the adequacy of DNA. And um, the icons of evolution themselves are the subject of another book, and it's worth reading too, but we're not going to go back at this point. This is what the cover looks like, and um, uh, in chapter one we, uh, we had some introductory remarks about science, evolution, and trusting scientists. When you're doing this kind of thing, you do need to kind of set forth your philosophical uh, views on science. And um, the uh, next chapter is the Tree of Life and homolo Homology, uh, which are two of the icons of evolution that have become part of the zombie science. And then he covers the other eight in the next chapter, the Miller-Urey apparatus, Heckel's embryos, Archaeopteryx, peppered moths, Darwin's finches, four-winged fruit flies, the horse series, and the chimp human series. And interestingly enough, the horse series has mostly died by now and is being taken by today's subject, the fossil whale series. Um, and then uh, the next chapter was uh, the secret of life, which DNA is not completely. It is necessary, but not sufficient to specify an organism. And uh, so we come to chapter five, which um, starts out with a, uh, a note from Darwin. Um, Darwin wrote in the first edition of The Origin of Species that North American black bears had been seen swimming for hours with, wides, with widely open mouths, thus catching like a whale insects in the water. Well, what did this have to do with the subject of his book? Even in so extreme a case as this, Darwin continued, if the supply of insects were constant, and if better adapted competitors did not already exist in the country, I can see no difficulty in a race of bears being rendered by natural selection more and more aquatic in their structure and habits, with larger and larger mouths, till a creature was produced as monstrous as a whale. Well, Critics poked fun at this, and Darwin removed it from later editions. But he defended it privately. The bear case has been well laughed at and disingenuously distorted by some into my saying that a bear could be converted into a whale. Disingenuously? I don't think so. Um, he wrote in an 1860 letter, as it offended persons, I struck it out in the second edition. But I still maintain that there is no especial difficulty in a bear's mouth being enlarged to any degree useful to its changing habits. No more difficulty than man has found in increasing the crop of the pigeon by continued selection until it is literally as big as the whole rest of the body. What's, what's the crop? Pardon me? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a part of the digestive tract. And apparently it has been bred to the point where the pigeon is mostly crop. Of course, you have to protect the pigeon at that point, but, you know, it's not. Um, that has to be artificial, not natural selection. Uh, but of course, bears with large mouths are a very long way from being whales. The evolution of whales long remained a problem for Darwin and his followers until some fossils were discovered in the 1990s and strung together into new icon of evolution. Just in time to take the horse series place. The fossil record. Land mammals occur in the fossil record before whales, um, which means whales couldn't have evolved from water mammals. Um, by 1859, fossils of two extinct whales had been found, Dorodon 
a dolphin-like mammal about 16 feet long, and Basilosaurus, a serpent-like mammal about 65 feet long. But Dorodon and Basilosaurus were both fully aquatic. In the early 1980s, the fossil of an extinct land animal the size of a wolf was discovered in Pakistan. Judging from the rocks in which it was found, it was older than Dorodon or uh, Basilosaurus. Although the animal looked nothing like a whale, a bone in its middle ear resembled something that had previously been found only in whales, dolphins, and porpoises, a bone called an involucrum. It uh, has, has to be in the middle ear, and it's not as easy to show and make it clear what it is, uh, but it, it is there. Whales, dolphins, and porpoises are collectively called cetaceans from the Latin word cetus, meaning whales. Although whale is traditionally defined as a large, fully aquatic mammal, the small fossilized land animal was called pachycetus, or Pakistani whale, because of its involucrum. How's that for naming? The possibility that the involucrum had originated more than once was not considered because that would require more uh, evolution than they, they liked. The evolutionary story about whales needed an ancestor and Pachycetus was the best candidate on hand. But Pachycetus was fully terrestrial, so merely calling it a whale did not fill the chasm between land animals and whales. Not surprisingly, critics of evolution continue to point to that chasm as a problem for Darwin's theory. As recently as 1993, a book critical of evolution stated that there are no clear transitional fossils linking land mammals to whales. The very next year, however, paleontologist Hans Thewissen and his colleagues reported the discovery in Pakistan of a fossil older than Dorodon or Basilosaurus, but younger than Pachycetus. The animal had legs that would have enabled it to walk on land like a modern sea lion which doesn't walk very well. Um, but it also had a long tail that would have enabled it to swim like a sea otter. Thewissen and his colleagues interpreted the fossil to be intermediate between land animals and whales, and they named it Ambulocetus natans, or swimming, walking whale. Literally, walking whale swimming. A few months later, Paleontologist Philip Gingrich and his colleagues discovered a slightly younger fossil in Pakistan they interpreted to be intermediate between Ambulocetus and modern whales. They called their discovery Rhodocetus. Sorry, and there is the figure. <coughs> and uh, you can see Pachycetus, Ambulocetus, uh, Myocetus. Uh, which means mother whale, by the way, and we'll find out why shortly, and Cuchicetus and Rhodocetus and, and Dorodon and Basilosaurus, and then, of course, the modern blue whale. Now, that makes a wonderful icon, by the way. The embarrassment of past absence. Notice that there was embarrassment over the past absence, although they didn't want to say it has been replaced by a bounty of new evidence, announced Stephen Jay Gould, and by the sweetest series of transitional fossils an evolutionist could ever hope to find. According to Gould, this sequential discovery of picture-perfect intermediacy in the evolution of whales stands as a triumph in the history of paleontology. Yes! I cannot imagine a better tale for the popular presentation of science or a more satisfying and intellectually based political victory over lingering creationist opposition. Notice they're still concerned about creationists and notice that it's actually not a scientific victory, it's a political one. So walking whales became an icon of evolution. More fossils of mammals supposedly ancestral to modern cetaceans have subsequently been in, reported, including Cuchicetus in 2000, Endohias in 2007, and Myocetus in 2009. Many textbooks use artist conceptions of these animals to I illustrate the evolutionary story of whales. 
Like the textbook illustrations, figure 5-1 distorts some things to fit the evolutionary theory. Basilosaurus and Dorodon were contemporaries, not series. And the fossil records of some of the others overlapped each other. All of the walking whales, those whose names end with Encetus, are reconstructed from incomplete skeletons. Pachycetus at the time was only known from a skull, though we know more about it now. And Cuchicetus was actually smaller than Myocetus or Ambulocetus. Let's look at that figure again. Notice that Cuchicetus has been enlarged so that it looks like a nice series. In any case, none of the fossils in figure 5-1 uh, were ancestors or descendants of the others. Wait. According to paleontologist Kevin Padian, and some of you may know Kevin Padian from his stint at the uh, Center for, uh, a National Center for Science Education, I believe. Yeah. Um, this is because Ambulocetus, Rhodocetus, Pachycetus, and other forms each have their own distinguishing characteristics, which they would have to lose in order to be considered direct ancestors of other known forms. In other words, we're having the same problem we had with the horse series, where it's not a straight line up. It's more like branching bush-like if, if you're going to make it any branches at all. So if there were animal ancest uh, animals ancestral to modern whales, these fossils would not represent them. The arrows in figure 5-1 are not just imaginary. They're actually misleading. Were they really whales? As in textbook illustrations, the form, uh, figure, forms in figure 5-1 between Pachycetus and Dorodon are drawn to show they were swimming, but they actually lived mainly on land. The Myocetus, and that's why mother whale becomes important, that was described in 2009 by Gingrich and his colleagues, was a pregnant female with a fetus inside it and to quote them, the fetal skeleton is positioned head for head-first birth. A universal birthing posture in large-bodied land mammals, but one that is anomalous in fully aquatic marine mammals, who are generally born tail-first, so that they can head up to the surface to get a breath as soon as possible. In other words, the animal gave birth on land. Cuchicetus looks, uh, looked a bit like a long-snouted crocodile with short, weight-bearing legs. Rhodocetus had smaller hind limbs. It may have moved like a sea lion on land, swum like, uh, with a dog paddle on the surface of the water, and moved like an otter underwater. None of these animals were really whales or even close. Otters and sea lions are amphibious land animals that spend some of their lives in the water, but whales, dolphins, and porpoises spend all of their lives in the water. As he noted, beached whales die unless you do something about it quickly. They can't give birth on land. Pachycetus, the first walking whale to be discovered, was classified as a cetacean because it possessed an involucrum. That's a little bone in the middle ear. Yet it turns out that Indohyus also possessed an involucrum, but it is not considered a cetacean. Instead, it is classified in the order of mammals that includes pigs, hippopotamuses, giraffes, antelopes, sheep, and cattle, because it had hoofs. It's an artiodactyl, to be specific. The Thewissen and his colleagues who described Indohyus wrote in 2007, until now, the involucrum was the only character occurring in all fossil and recent cetaceans, but in no other mammals. Identification of the involucrum in Indohyus calls into question what it is to be a cetacean. It requires either that the concept of cetacea be expanded to include Indohyus, or that the involucrum cease to characterize cetaceans. The authors argued for the latter, that the involucrum should no longer be used to characterize cetaceans. But then, how do you know that Pachycetus is a cetacean? Um, uh, you might be interested that in um, the internet sources that uh, I ran into, 
uh, the argument is made that Endohias was in fact the first whale before even Pachycetus. In other words, the involucrum is diagnostic of cetaceans, except when it isn't. So why should we call Pachycetus a cetacean? Why not just call it what it was, a land mammal? And why should we call Ambulocetus, Myocetus, Cuchocetus, and Rhodocetus cetaceans? Why not just call them what they were, amphibious mammals that spend part of their lives on land and part of their lives in the water? The answer, of course, is obvious. We need them as bridges to whales. In other words, Gould's sweetest series of transitional fossils is missing the most important transition of all. The transition from living primarily on land, um, and especially giving birth on land, to living entirely in the water. What does it take to make a whale? Well, fossils of the fully aquatic whales Dordon and Basilosaurus appeared in a geologic period called the Eocene and rocks that geologists have dated to about 40 million years ago. Um, Myocetus, Cuchocetus, and Rhodocetus were found in Eocene rocks dated between two and eight million years before that. So based on this fossil evidence, the transition from land mammals to fully aquatic mammals occurred in eight million years or less. What changes would mammals have to undergo in those eight million years to transform them from terrestrial or amphibious mammals into fully aquatic ones? Quite a few. Many features of cetaceans differ dramatically from the features of terrestrial mammals. What follows is just a small sampling of them. Features needed for swimming. A cetacean propels itself through the water primarily by the up and down movements of large projections at the end of its tail, called flukes. Except for tail vertebrae running down their centers, flukes contain no bones. They are made of fibrous connective tissue. Yet cetacean flukes are not passive flippers like those used by human scuba divers. Instead, their movements are coordinated by a complex system of long, powerful tendons connecting them to specialized muscles in the tail. In the blue whale in figure 5-1, the uh, tail begins between the small dorsal fin and the flukes. The tail can be flexed up and down relative to the body, but the flukes can be moved independently of the tail. According to Everhard Schleiper's uh, classic book on cetaceans, the flukes can be moved with respect to the other sections. So the fact that during motion the flukes make an angle with the rest of the tail is not due to their passive reaction to the pressure of the water as it is in the fish, but to an active mus muscular exertion. In the 1880s, remember Schleifer is quite old, anatomists already knew how complicated and ingenious the structure of these organs really is. Uh, skipping, if you want to read the whole thing, read the book. Um, cetaceans also have dorsal fins, which are among the features that distinguish cetaceans from terrestrial and amphibious mammals. Features needed for breathing. A cetacean breathes by means of nostrils on the top of its head called blowholes. All living cetaceans have blowholes on the tops of their heads. So for a land animal to have evolved into a cetacean, its nostrils would have had to relocate to the top of its head, sooner or later at least. A blowhole is surrounded by thick lips consisting of highly elastic tissue. According to Sleiper, this um, Tissue normally keeps the blowhole closed by tension even when the whale is at the surface. To open it during breathing, the whale has numerous muscles which run from the lips to the skull below. Obviously, this method of closing the blowhole is much more effective at keeping out water than the method found in seals, sea lions, and land mammals, whose nostrils are normally open and must be closed underwater by an active contraction of muscles. Of course, humans can't close them at least not completely. And so if we go in, we have to hold our nose or else um, allow water to get in or always keep them upright. Um, although they breathe at the surface, cetaceans are famous for their deep dives. Sea lions and seals, though full, not fully aquatic, are also famous for their deep dives. 
Dolphins and porpoises can dive to depths of 300 meters. Weddell seals can dive to 600 meters. Sperm whales can dive to 2,000 meters. And beaked whales can dive almost 3,000 meters. Over 9,800 feet, almost a kilometer. Uh, no. no, I'm sorry. 3,000 meters is three kilometers. That's uh, almost 10,000 feet. Now, a sperm whale at 2,000 meters experiences about 200 times the pressure it ex experiences at the surface. Bones are not strong enough to protect lungs from such high pressure, so deep diving mammals have collapsible rib cages and collapsible lungs. The rib cages of cetaceans have a lot of floating ribs, ones not attached to the sternum. Don't have a picture of that, but it's interesting because the sternum almost attaches to nothing. Cetaceans and other diving mammals also have diaphragms that are oriented nearly parallel to the spine rather than perpendicular to it as uh, humans do. Uh, anesthesiologist Richard Burton and physiologist James Butler explain that the large area of contact between the lung and the diaphragm in cetaceans allows for the diaphragm to smoothly collapse the lung along the lung's shortest dimension, which is belly to back. A typical sperm whale dive lasts more than an hour. A beaked whale dive may last more than two hours. How can cetaceans stay underwater so long? It's thanks to yet another metabolic engineering marvel. Cetaceans have far more myoglobin, that's an oxygen storage molecule in their muscles, than land mammals. Nevertheless, as Schleiper points out, not even the large quantities of myoglobin they have provided they have provide an adequate explanation for their long stay underwater. During diving, basic changes in the metabolism must occur. The blood supply is redistributed to the brain and the heart. The heart slows down, and the muscles switch to anaerobic metabolism. All vertebrates do this to some extent when they're deprived of air, but deep diving mammals do it more completely and efficiently. Skipping over a few paragraphs, features needed for reproduction. In most mammals, sperm production requires a temperature several degrees below normal body temperature. Thus, the testicles of most terrestrial mammals are held outside the body, but male cetaceans have internal testicles, which must be cooled below body temperature despite the fact that they are surrounded by heat-generating muscles. The cooling is accomplished with a countercurrent heat exchanger. <coughs> Uh, uh, which we have a countercurrent exchanger in kidneys, among other things. Uh, it's not usually heat there. Uh, it's rather osmolality. osmolality. Uh, and interestingly enough, count, countercurrent uh, oxygen exchanger is found in the lungs of birds. It's a, it's a uh, nifty little design feature that we as humans have learned to, to use. Uh, in some of our industrial processes. Um, blood that has been cooled in the dorsal fin and flukes is carried to a region near the testicles where it flows through a network of veins that pass between arteries carrying warm blood in the opposite direction. The arterial blood is thereby cooled before it reaches the testicles. And interestingly enough, the venous blood is also warmed. And here's figure 5.2. And interestingly, at least according to the figure, you have stuff not only coming from the flukes, but also from the dorsal fin, apparently. And the idea is that warm stuff is coming one way, cool stuff is coming the other way. And at first, the cool, uh, the, at first the, the Warm blood cools the, uh, partially warm blood cools the uh, fully warm uh, blood. And then as it gets, uh, um, the temperature drops down and more cooling takes place to when you finally come out of the, with the arteries, the uh, arteries are cooled down to pretty close to the temperature of the uh, cool blood that has come from the uh, flukes, and that allows the testes to stay cool. 
If this engineering arrangement were due to evolution, the relocation of cetacean testicles to the inside could not have preceded the countercurrent heat exchange system, because then there's no drive to do it. Otherwise, the whale would have been sterile, an evolutionary dead end. You move the testes in without doing this, and you can't have any babies, and of course that takes care of your progeny. Uh, yet there is no adaptive advantage to developing a countercurrent heat exchange system around the testes unless they are inside the body. So one would not come before the other, yet the probability that both would evolve simultaneously is effectively zero. Also, after birth, cetacean calves must be nursed underwater. But young calves cannot stay underwater as long as adults. They have to surface frequently to breathe. So nursing in cetaceans is very different from nursing in terrestrial mammals. A cetacean's mother's nipples are recessed in, in two slits on either side of the genital opening. According to Slyper, when um, suckling their young, cetaceans move very slowly. The calf follows behind and approaches the nipple from the back. The cow then turns a little to the side, so the calf has easier access to the nipple, which has meanwhile emerged from its slit. Since the calf lasts, lacks the proper lips, it has to seize the nipple between the tongue and the tip of the palate. The mother then forcefully squirts milk into the calf. Even after the calf lets go, milk can often be seen squirting from the nipple. The milk is three to four times as concentrated as the milk of cows and goats. It has the consistency of condensed milk or liquid yogurt. The calf thereby receives much more nourishment in a much shorter time. It also has a lot of fat in it. Thus many features would have had to originate in the eight million years or less between the so-called walking whales and fully aquatic whales, including flukes, blowholes, internal testicles, and specialized features for nursing and many other features not mentioned here. This is a tall order. Indeed, a growing body of evidence suggests that for evolution it's an insurmountably tall order. Neo-Darwinism assumes that anatomical changes originated in DNA mutations. As we saw in chapter four, this assumption is false. Decades of experiments have shown that DNA mutations do not produce beneficial new anatomical features. But for the sake of argument, let's ignore that fact and proceed as though the standard evolutionary theory might be true. Let's also ignore for now the criticism in chapter four of the modern use of the word gene. Ignore all that and the evolutionary theory still faces a big problem. Well, genes, some genes have larger effects than others because they regulate other genes. According to Thewissen, hind limbs disappeared in cetaceans because of changes in regulatory genes and the same regulatory genes may also have effects on other parts of the dolphin's anatomy, and possibly those same genes were involved in shaping the other parts of the anatomy of the Eocene cetaceans. But what genes might they have been? Well, cetaceans are divided into two suborders, toothed and baleen. The first suborder includes dolphins, porpoises, and sperm whales, among others. The second um, suborder includes gray whales, right whales, and blue whales, among others. As we saw in chapter four, Hox genes are involved in specifying the locations of structures along the head to tail axis of animals, and similar Hox genes are found in many kinds of animals. In 1998, a team of scientists found that a gene affecting limb development in chicks and mice also occurs in baleen whales, but the whale version was missing some nucleotides. When they inserted the whale version of the gene into a mouse embryo, they found that it was not expressed in the place where mouse hind limbs would normally form. Ah, we've discovered what makes the difference and why they don't have hind limbs. It might be tempting to argue that the missing nucleotides explain why whales lack hind limbs. Though the authors of the 1998 studies did not argue that, that and Lars uh, Bader, I guess, and Brian Hall pointed out in 2002 that the missing nucleotides are not missing in other whales, all of which lack hind limbs. So, oops, well that wasn't the whole story at least. Bader and Hall continued, uh, concluded a similar, a simple evolutionary change in Hox gene expression 
or Hawks gene regulation is unlikely to have driven loss of the hind limbs in cetaceans. A genetic analysis published in 2011 concluded that baleen whales have genes for several proteins contained in enamel, but the genes have been inactivated by mutations. So they don't, this might explain why baleen whales lack teeth, but it clearly does not explain why they have baleen. Another genetic analysis published in 2014 concluded that various taste receptor genes in both tooth and baleen cetaceans have been inactivated by mutations. Once again, however, the loss of features cannot explain the origin of features. Mutations in a gene called ASPM cause severe reductions in brain size in humans. In 2012, a team of scientists used a molecular phylogenetic tree to infer that the sequence of ASPM has changed, in more, changed more in cetaceans and primates, both of which have large brains, than in other ant mammals. The scientists, have, uh, scientists concluded that positive natural selection at the ASPM gene coincides with brain size enlargement in cetaceans. Now, sounds pretty impressive until you realized in 2014 there was a study that pointed out that the 2012 study did not explicitly test for a connection between ASPM and brain size. Uh, the obvious thing, does it actually, is it actually true? According to the authors of the 2014 study, the conclusion of the 2012 study was uh, not supported. A polite way of saying, you have no evidence. So the available evidence does not even come close to identifying genes that could turn a land mammal into a fully aquatic cetacean. In the absence of anything like direct evidence, let's consider a more indirect approach. How many mutations? As we saw above, the fossil record shows that the transition from terrestrial or amphibious mammals to fully aquatic cetaceans occurred in eight million years or less. Eight million years might seem like a long time, but if cetaceans evolved by the accumulation of natural, pardon me, of accidental mutations in a land-dwelling ancestor, it might not have been long enough. How many genes would have, would have to change during those eight million years? Nobody really knows, of course, but a 2016 study of giraffes might provide some insight. An international team of biologists compared over 13,000 genes from giraffes and okapis. Okapis are similar to giraffes, but have much shorter necks. The comparison showed that the giraffe has 70 genes that they could identify that exhibit unique genetic changes and likely contribute to giraffes' unique features. So in order to make a giraffe out of an okapi, you have to have at least 72 changes. The 2016 study estimated that the common ancestor of giraffes and okapis lived about 11 million years ago. So the time frame is not very different from the gap between walking whales and fully aquatic cetaceans. Matter of fact, it's a little longer. Let's begin by assuming that it took only one mutation to modify each of the giraffe's 46 distinctive neck genes. This is surely an underestimate. It may have taken way more than that. But, so now let's extrapolate from that figure to estimate how many mutations would be needed to involve, evolve a whale from a land mammal. Lengthening of the neck and modifying the heart and nerves in giraffes might be compared to lengthening the tail and modifying the muscles and nerves in cetaceans. But that does not include the origin of new features such as flukes and dorsal fins, top of the head blowholes with the specialized musculature, internal testicles with a countercurrent heat exchange system, or specialized features for nursing underwater. Unless we assume, quite unrealistically, that mutations in a few regulatory genes could produce all these effects, it is clear that at least hundreds or thousands of mutations would be needed to explain how walking whales evolved into modern cetaceans. How long does it take for nature to generate and select that many mutations? Mutation rates have been experimentally determined in many different for many different organisms. Mutations occur in the course of reproduction, so the rate at which they occur depends on generation time, that is the time between birth and sexual maturity, and the effective size of the breeding population. Not all animals in a population are actively breeding at any given time. 
Also, for a mutation to affect an entire species, it must spread from the individual in which it occurs to the entire population. In the language of population genetics, it must become fixed. Neo-Darwinian population geneticists have incorporated these variables into standard formulas that estimate how long it takes for mutations to become fixed. A 2008 study using, used these, those formulas to calculate that two mutations in regulatory genes could become fixed in fruit flies in a few million years. In humans, however, which have a much smaller effective breeding populations and longer generation times, the process would take more than 100 million years. And that's in the literature to the internal, eternal embarrassment of, of evolutionists. Uh, biologist Richard Sternberg has applied this analysis to cetaceans. Large mammals, such as the supposed ancestors of cetaceans, tend to have effective breeding population sizes comparable to that of humans. But modern whales reach maturity much faster, so their generation times are much shorter. Assuming a generation time of 25 years for humans and five years for the ancestors of cetaceans, so they're about one-fifth of ours, maybe. Um, Sternberg pointed out that fixing just two mutations in the latter would take millions of years longer than the time available in the fossil record. And it's probably worth noting that in order to get the testes inside, you have to have probably at least two mutations, at least. One for the cooling mechanism and one for the uh, testes themselves. So there isn't enough time to fix even two mutations, yet we need hundreds or even thousands of new mutations. Obviously, eight million years is not enough to accumulate enough accidental mutations to turn a walking whale into a real whale. Even if neo-Darwinian theory were right about the power of mutations, which it isn't. It gets worse. In 2016, a team of paleontologists published a report on the, of their discovery in Antarctica of a fossilized whale similar to Basilosaurus. Uh, I might note they actually did this, uh, they discovered it in 2011 and it was well known, uh, but it wasn't published because they were trying to figure out what to do with it. Uh, the fossil occurred in rocks previously reported to be at least 49 million years old, older than some of the so-called walking whales. This would reduce the time available for land mammal to whale evolution from 8 million years to practically no time at all, making the problem of whale evolution even worse. Faced with this problem, the paleontologists who reported the discovery argued that the date of 49 million years, which is what everything else was dating to except for, I think, Pachycetus, might be biased. Or, of course, their view of it might be biased. They argued instead that a date no older than 46 million years was more consistent. And that gives you three million years to do the job instead of zero. It was more consistent with the fossil record of other whales. Well, we found this whale and it's way early, but all the other whales are late, so this one must be late too. I love the logic. But adjusting the date to be more consistent with the standard story isn't how empirical science is supposed to work. So the sweetest series of transitional fossils an evolutionist could ever hope to find is not so sweet after all. It quickly sours with a little additional digging. With enough imagination, anyone can invent a story about how land animals evolved into whales, but an imaginative story is not empirical science. When the materialistic story of whale evolution ignores inconvenient evidence, it is zombie science. Now, my take on all this, on this chapter is that Wells makes a good case that the whale series has significant flaws. Uh, flaws that would sink some other uh, uh, areas in science. At one point, whales were a huge embarrassment for Darwinists. Then, with a little imagination, a series could be made that was superficially persuasive and, with the appropriate visual aids, could be used against creationists. Creationists meaning anybody who believes in a god that intervenes. But the whale story has to, be, has to assume extremely rapid evolution, 
sometimes, as in the case of the testis, needing coordinated changes. That means kind of what uh, Behe used to call irreducible complexity. Now this is the most optimistic scenario. And the discovery of an older Basilosaurus jaw argues that the time for evolution is even shorter than previously believed. If we take the most natural interpretation, it's less than two million years and all of the intermediates except for Pachycetus itself disappear. Judging from other animals, we might find orphan genes that have to evolve within this time as well. Um, although I don't think we have actual evidence in this particular case. But keep in mind that virtually all species where they've been looked at, we have found them. At some point, the theory should be abandoned. And at the very least at that point, evolutionary theorists, uh, theorists should go back to being intellectually unfulfilled. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. It uh, pro might be of interest that uh, probably the best collection of these fossil wheels is at the University of Michigan. Uh, You've heard of the Mich uh, University of Michigan, haven't you? Yes, uh, I happen to be familiar with that <laughs> institution. It's, it's in the, uh, used to be in the Rudvin building. Uh, and uh, they have the, the major types of these intermediates there, and of course it's, it's been criticized by creationists over the years, uh, and so on. Uh, they uh, have decided at the University of Michigan to build a new biology building, and it's, uh, it's completing its course, and uh, uh, the old building where I did my research is uh, no longer going to be for biology, but uh, in this new building, uh, they are going to have also the museum of these whales uh, collection and others uh, in their hall of evolution. And uh, the uh, idea that uh, Vasilosaurus uh, might be a questionable intermediate. Uh, uh, doesn't seem to be in the ethos right now. Just this last month, I got a publication, uh, an alumni publication, and there was a picture here of the uh, the old building where the uh, Basilosaurus and other fossil flails used to be in, uh, uh, and right next to it is is the new building, and in between it, uh, they had put a. Basilosaurus was right there. I think it was Basilosaurus. It was between them, and it reported uh, indirectly as an allusion to uh, an intermediate. Uh, they have not given up the idea at all <laughs> about the whale. At all. This has been under a great deal of, of criticism, and uh, it might be of interest also in this discussion to note that uh, uh, Gingrich, who was there at the University of Michigan, uh, 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 we mentioned several times here, and C. Wyson, who was in Indiana, I think, uh, uh, is Gingrich's graduate student. Just been a little bit of, there's a relationship between these two authors. As I understand, Gingrich is kind of the grandfather of all this whole uh, uh, search for whales. Most of the whales have been found by him uh, or his colleagues. Yeah, this this has been his contribution, his major life contribution. So uh, one can understand why the University of Michigan uh, is uh, puts it up somewhat on display. This is their specialty. That's where a lot of this work has been done. Yes. A um, ignoramus's question, I guess. It's okay. <laughs> About evolution. Um, I had the understanding that the idea that they start out 
from water and move to land. In this case, it's reversed and I'm, can you explain what, how, or is, am I thinking wrong or how does, has that worked for whales? Well, it yeah, goes it, the other direction. Yeah, originally the, the story is because you have animals on both water and land, originally the story is that some fish developed uh, leg-like appendages that eventually turned into legs uh, and developed lungs and were able to get onto land and eventually became amphibians. And then the amphibians became reptiles. Amphibians still require quite a bit of water and they don't reproduce without water, uh, basically. Um, even, even toads require water in order to, to actually mate and have uh, offspring. But uh, then when you get to, to reptiles, you have fully land mammals that, you know, other than whatever they have to drink uh, to keep themselves alive, uh, basically don't need water at all. Uh, and, then, uh, and then reptiles became both birds and mammals, uh, or some reptiles, and some obviously stayed reptiles. Um, and then when mammals developed, some mammals are found in the sea now, and so they had to come from somewhere, and they have enough common characteristics with other mammals that it's hard to believe that they evolved by themselves. So otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, it didn't make a lot of sense. Um, now, I think that uh, some reptiles are supposed to have moved into the water, although since we don't actually have any fully aquatic reptiles at this point, um, it's hard to say for sure. But you wonder whether, for example, the Mosasaur um, ever got out of water, uh, whether it was kind of like a whale. We don't have a specimen. I mean, we have, we have skeletons, but we don't have actual, you know, uh, living, breathing, or, yeah, and they would be breathing, uh, specimens that we can say, oh yeah, this is a, in fact, a uh, mosasaur and it lives all of its life in the water. We don't know that. So at this point, maybe there were two returns to the water. Um, but certainly we have actual living, breathing mammals in the water that can't come out, that if they come out, they die unless you get them right back in. And so they, they don't bear their young on land. Um, they're fully aquatic at that point. Um, and so uh, those ones had to evolve from other mammals. If you, if you force a tree of life, that's one of the things you have to force. And it's always been a problem and then Philip Gingrich thought he solved that problem, although you can see that there's some problems with that solution as well. And the Basilosaurus thing is just fascinating how they, uh, how they date stuff and, uh, uh, and how if you, if you need wiggle room in your date, you can create it. Let's put it that way. So they, they said, uh they they had to have evolved from mammals, and mammals evolved Were, evolved from the sea creatures, and so it was. So you had creatures that came, came on land, land and then and stay then on land, land the whole time, and, and then now you have creatures that have gone go back, back to, to the, the water. water. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise, you have you have to evolve mammals twice: once in land and once in the water. And the, evolutionarily, that's just r too much to swallow. Uh, yes. This illustrates uh, one of the criticisms that's been leveled at evolution, and that is that uh, no matter what happens, you have a, a model of evolution that satisfies it, and the, hence there's no way to disprove evolution because uh, anything works. No matter what you suggest, it's okay. 
Well, I think that sometimes you can stretch the model until it feels like it ought to break. Depends on how you, what you want to believe. That's true. We have a comment back here. Oh, uh, uh, okay. And then uh, we'll get you afterwards. Isn't it true that there are several scientists across the street in the Geoscience Institute that are studying whales in Chilean deserts? And have, yes. they, have they published it yet? Yes. Oh, yes. They have gotten their stuff published. And there are some interesting things that come across. Um, and if we weren't setting them up for, uh, uh, for failure to publish in future uh, uh, publications, I, I would probably ask them to come. I, in fact, I've suggested that, and they say, no, but if we, if we say what we really think, we'll never get published again. So we're going to have to say what they really think. But the research is going well. They're, they're having a whale of a time. Uh, I'd like to maybe move to the larger picture and look at how modern day Bible believers are solving some of these problems. Um, a lot of my research involves uh, responses to evolutionary science and how, let's use the term conservative in a little broader sense, conservative strong Bible believers have solved it. People's, people that even believe in inerrancy, which I did my research at Andrews on, um, you have maybe two or three different approaches on this. One approach is that you have so many gaps in the fossil record that you need divine intervention spaced out over millions of years and it's kind of the stair-step model of evolution. And every time you reach a period of stasis, then God injects uh, extra genetics and DNA, and then voila, a new creature develops. And then out of that new genetic plateau, there's radiation, there's a lot of microevolution. Mm -hmm. Everyone's comfortable with microevolution mm -hmm. until God injects something new and then you have a new creature, and this certainly applies to the whale picture. Yeah. So you have the you have the the Cambrian explosion, which is God injecting right. a whole bunch of stuff. That's God and then intervening. The mammalian explosion. Yeah. And the whale explosion, if that's how you're yeah. going to look at it. And the bird. And the bird explosion. Exactly. And, I mean, and the angiosperm explosion. I, I mean, it goes on. That theory didn't develop full-blown until the 1950s. Bernard Ram, a uh, believer in inerrancy, came up with the theory of progressive creation. He didn't even use the term evolution because uh, he believed that God, as creator, intervened at many stair steps in the evolutionary progress over 500 million years. And I did my uh, doctoral work on him and one other person. Uh, I had the chance to sit down f for more than an hour with Bernard Ram when he retired in Orange County, an elderly gentleman then, sharp as can be. And I said, have you ever read the writings of Stephen J. Gould? And he, uh, of course, uh, had not. He said, no, I haven't heard. He's heard of the name Gould, but he didn't know what Gould uh, was uh, promoting. And as you know, Gould uh, came up with a similar idea that evolution was in very rapid spurts, so rapid that there wasn't a geological record to really validate that it goes from one uh, plateau to another. Mm -hmm. And um, so, Let's see, what is Gould's theory? It's punctuated, punctuated equilibrium. equilibrium. It's interesting, uh, the founder of progressive creationism didn't know that Gould 
as a secular scientist, had said something quite similar, quite similar. But of course, one leaves God out of the picture, and then Ram puts God right into the um, all these gaps, you know. Then later on, you have the Grand Rapids professors, Bible believers that came along. Um, Davis Young had two or three different theories. You read his different books, and at different times he had uh, various theories. Finally, he went into straight theistic evolution. He started as a young earth creationist and a flood geologist, by the way. And then his colleague uh, in the astronomy department, science department, I forget his name, wrote a book on um, evolution. His idea was fully gifted creation that God put the whole complement of genetics into creatures at the very lowest levels. And then God allowed natural history to take over to bring out all of these things almost by a chance process. Was that Van Til? Van Til, Howard Van Til, thank okay. you. <laughs> it's been a while, it's been 30 years or more since I studied and interestingly him. enough, uh, uh, Van Til has had his own movement uh, from... There's another shift to more and more uh, secular um, evolution. All of these, many of these drift slowly by slowly. Even Bernard Ram started toward evolution. He was, late in his life, he was giving up progressive creation, as I understand. So, but the whale evolution, it's clear. Unless you have divine intervention and you have something happening in a very short period of time, you're not going to bridge any of these gaps. There are so many gaps, and I'm very gratified to see what you've presented here. I had no idea that there were all of these gaps. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in your comments on this, or anyone else's. Well, I've, I've given some of my comments already. Um, uh, Jack Stout has some comments. It was very interesting to follow this and think back. Um, yeah, uh, actually, if you want a proposal that fits the data, but is quite imaginary, it is progressive creation. It solves all the problems with no with no evidence, and while it would, you know. Uh, it's not the way many of us feel things happen. I personally liked the idea I just brought up, and I've forgotten the gentleman's name already, and that is where some of the original organisms were enriched with a much more varied genome than they expressed at the time. That kind of says that our creator envisioned that his creation may not be fully adapted to some of the changes that had followed. In some ways, without evidence, that's among the most appealing approaches. Uh, this uh, God of the gaps is a dead end if we want to go down that road. But I feel that actually, I'm part of me, I would change the topic. I don't know what your future's, future is, but one of the really big, big stories, and maybe it's because I've just been closer to it with my research on birds, is the origin of, of the whole order from dinosaurs to the place where many are calling birds are, are modern dinosaurs. I'd be very interested in hearing that pathway evaluated, because it seems to be one of the bigger and most recent, and for many, more, more convincing uh, uh, presentations. Uh, we do have to be careful when we make real advances not to overinterpret. And uh, the beautiful work that was done on fossil whales in Peru had very clear evidence for those fossils being uh, alive and they died in place or transported, one of the two. But unfortunately, 
in either case, those fossils could be essentially as well explained by more standard evolutionary theory as they're burial by some catastrophic event. So you have to be really careful, although I think it's beautiful work. Actually, if you saw it, the uh, they made the front page of geology yep, when they published. They did. They did. Well, it's, it's spectacular. You have these whales. Uh, yeah. Complete skeletons. I mean, missing basically nothing. Uh, and in fact, the baleen still attached to the jaw. Right. And that falls apart in about three or four days or so under natural conditions. So we're talking about burial, you know, much more yes. rapidly than conventionally one would have. And they did. They did lovely work. I don't want to sound, and, sound and, critical and in the least. In, burial in diatom. Uh, yes. Deposits, which kind of implies that the diatom deposits must have really come up fast. Uh, that in itself is interesting. Um, and uh, I mean, there's, there's all this evidence for rapid burial. And then you do the radiometric dating of one uh, ash deposit and another ash deposit, and you find that there's supposed to be millions of uh, years between the two, and you're going, don't think so. Which raises some very interesting questions yeah. about. Well, the story of, of the whale is also, to me, very interesting in another way. Uh, as we interpret the flood, there's clearly no room in an ark for whales. Yes. No, and, and so what, nor, nor we're, should we're, there be if it's a flood. The whales can get along fine by themselves. Yeah, but then we look at the preservation of the others as divinely picking each species or whatever. Yes. And I'm not questioning that. I'm just saying if you look at the, big, the bigger picture. Well, if you want to have some fun, one could make two... Uh, predictions and uh, test them sometime. One of them is that the whales should have maintained most of their genetic diversity and therefore you would expect mitochondria in whales, for example, or Y chromosomes in whales, to be a little more diverse than those of land animals in general. That would be an interesting thing to test. Yes. And it could be tested. We have the technology to do it now. Uh, in fact, uh, mitochondrial barcodes would be a great place to start. Um, the, next, uh, the next thing that you might predict is that if people are looking hard enough, which mostly they haven't been, we might be able to see whales earlier in the fossil record. And, you know, they talk about a Precambrian rabbit, but a Precambrian whale would be almost as impressive. <laughs> or even a Cambrian <laughs> to say whale. The least. Uh, and uh, it might be interesting to start, you know, for, for uh, Adventists and other conservative Christian um, uh, paleontologists to start looking for those kinds of things. It would be interesting to ask the question, what would somebody do? I mean, you can see the desperation already with what they did with the Basilosaurus jaw, where they argued that the dating was incorrect, even though the dating looks perfectly correct. Because if the dating is correct, then you have no time for the evolution of whales. Um, another, and this will be my last comment, another piece that caught my eye for a number of years, especially with teaching the kids we love about this, uh, that was kind of a conundrum. I did my PhD thesis on the behavior of a type of fish that is a so-called primary freshwater means they could not survive any salinity. And yet I can find modern day primary freshwater fish, the same species in North America and in the middle of Russia. A serious biogeographical question. Well, they went across the Bering Land Bridge. I mean, what else? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it's about as good as an answer as you can come up with, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I, I would suggest we keep in mind that uh, fresh water floats on top of salt water, and that mixing doesn't go all that fast. Uh, Amazon River runs out for miles and miles before it mixes with the salt water. Uh, so possibility of some survival through that is not excluded. Yeah, and all it takes is two fish. <laughs> One gravid female. <laughs> You've got some special protection. Well, to, to be fair, it, it, one, you have to have a male because the female will probably deposit the eggs and then have to have them fertilized. So you really do need two fish. Yes. Yeah. For you, mammals, if, one gravid female will do. If you have external fertilization. Uh, most fish do. Yeah, but not all. Okay. Well, in this case, this whole group is externally fertilized. It's uh, externally fertilized. So. Yeah, in this particular case, you do have to have two. But still, two fish is not, I mean, if you have thousands or perhaps millions of fish, uh, to have two of them survive somehow um, isn't quite as much of a stretch if you have a vast ocean and then all they have to do is, is stay on some kind of pocket of fresh water on the top. The other thing is that supposedly, um, you know, the biblical record implies, it doesn't exactly state, but it implies that all the landmass was together. In which case, all, all you have to do is keep them surviving on the top and then have it go down. And in the meantime, the continents get to, uh, to split. Well, that's often when I talk to other students, that's kind of where the conversation went, is among the most likely possible ways of explaining I don't need the mic. Yeah, okay. Well, other people do, because they're going to listen to you, and we want, we want your words. Well, you know, I, I want to be quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, on this specific to topic, there are a lot of scenarios. We don't have enough evidence to nail any one of them down. But I did hear the word flood recently behind me. I heard the words Noah's Ark recently, and that's where I want to leap into the discussion. Um, let's look at the larger picture. You had a picture of the geological column there with the uh, supposed ancestors of whales mm -hmm. um, piled up one yes. on top of another. Um, you know, there's going to be dotted lines all the way up, and I like oh, the... Yeah. The idea that all of these are dead-end branches, there's, there's no direct c connection, at least according to the book Zombie Science, so let's stick with that. A larger problem is geologically where you have all of these Cenozoic. You saw that the oldest one is Eocene. There's one other formation below the Eocene in the Cenozoic, and that is Paleocene. And that's where you really have modern mammals first appear. You have some other mammals back in the age of dinosaurs, so to speak, if there is an age of dinosaurs. But you have the modern mammals. Now, one of the leading flood models says that the flood ended when the dinosaurs went extinct because the flood caused a lot of creatures to go extinct, all the Paleozoic practically, most of the Mesozoic, all the Mesozoic mammals went extinct when the dinosaurs were wiped out, and that's right at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Tertiary is Cenozoic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, two of the leading lights in this theory are our most highly educated creationists, Stephen A. Austin, PhD, uh, in a secular in university, and then Kurt Wise, a PhD student of, of um, Stephen Jay Gould. Mm -hmm. So kind of the leading lights have gotten together, about six or eight men, and they published in 1996, saying that the flood uh, ended before the tertiary deposits began. Now, if that's true, all of these that we saw on the screen are post-flood. 
Where do they come from? <laughs> the, the, the marine ones, where do they come from? The uh, land ones, where do <laughs> they come from? All of a sudden, they pop up on the uh, screen, so to speak, the screen being the history mm -hmm. of, of uh, geology here. Where did they come from? If they're post-flood purely, if that's true, you had an awful lot of evolution to produce some of these, if you use uh, Van Til's model of a fully gifted creation. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we're raising as many questions as we are answers. Yeah. But I like the basic answer that all of these have gaps between them. I'm not arguing against that at all. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah. it's, it's of interest that um, <laughs> the... <laughs> did I... Okay. Uh, it, it's of interest that the, uh, the way the, uh, and I'm losing my thought now, um, uh, You're talking about the, gaps. the gaps, and I'm also talking about the the whale and the end of the and the end of the flood, the the flood. and um, uh, you have these whales buried in Peru. I think they're all. Like Pliocene or thereabouts. Yeah. Four million. Probably Pliocene. Standard, yes. standard uh, dating. Um, is they're obviously buried in water. They're obviously buried in most unusual water. Uh, just I uh, put it that way a water that can create a diatomaceous burial of an organism in. Uh, probably, to be fair, less than three days at its worst. Um, and uh, perhaps a little longer in some other circumstances. Perhaps some of the whales died and got blown into a, uh, an estuary or something like that and then, and then had diatomaceous earth uh, settle down upon them. Uh, but it's a fairly rapid process that um, now, where do you count the flood ending? Because if you're at a higher level, the uh, flood would end earlier. And then if you're at a lower level. And so, although conventionally the flood is a year, I'm not sure that you can take that year and say, oh, that ended everything. It's not like the you know, it came up to something and suddenly dropped off a cliff, it is more like the garage gradually came down. And so it is arguable, for one thing, the Cenozoic sediments are mostly water deposited. And so you're probably still looking at uh, flood type deposits just gradually decreasing. Um, um, it gets interesting because I'm, see, I'm an experimentalist and one of the things that I will eventually do if I have the chance is carbon date some of these fossils because at a certain point you expect carbon-14 to start rising rapidly and you should be able to say oh, this is you know 40,000 years and now mm -hmm. it's 20,000 mm -hmm. years and suddenly uh, you're looking at uh, uh, you're looking at organisms that are now taking in uh, more modern carbon-14 if you're making a flood model. And so you might be able to, you know, start saying that, mm -hmm. uh, for example, the Green River Formation, uh, turtles is what I'm trying to date first, if I can. Um, it'd be interesting to date a whole bunch of stuff um, and report all the data, by the way. That's one of the things that I think has unfortunately not been always done, is reporting all of the data that you get. Quick comment. That's very doable because in this very building, as you know, there are turtle skeletons uh, preserved. There are parts of whale bones. There are uh, sea lion and seals and all kinds of cetaceans um, preserved right in this building. So. Some they're just they're, waiting to yeah, be just, uh, dated, yeah, just waiting no, there. No, they are. They are. Um, you know, good luck in, in finding somebody to try to date it uh, by conventional means, I mean, in a conventional laboratory, because 
either they, they're not appreciative of the project or they're afraid that if they get answers that don't fit, uh, that their laboratory will be uh, un, unfairly uh, denigrated. Uh, and, there, and it's a reasonable fear, by the way. I mean, you know, you suddenly get answers that nobody else gets that, uh, that, no, or that, uh, that nobody else likes, and they don't want to test it. They just say, well, your, da your, your laboratory got it wrong. Um, yes? Uh, from a, I, I'm not a expert that was there during the flood, so I can't tell you for sure what happened, but... You don't have a video? Uh, I can say that the idea that... I don't want to appear too humble here, but the idea that uh, the flood ended at the Cretaceous is completely untenable. Uh, it's, uh, you've got all these flowering plants, most of them, above this, and you've got all the mammals, most above this, and so on. How do you have a worldwide flood and none of those things got involved in it? Uh, true, there are some scientists who have kind of adopted that, and, uh, but Ord, uh, for instance, thinks it's much higher than Cretaceous, and so does Baumgartner. Uh, and uh, you, you've got you know, how to account for those higher fossils. Well, see, this is the beauty of it. This is a, this is a testable hypothesis now. Because oh, it's, it's already if, been tested if, and proved wrong. I if mean. carbon fourteen <laughs> has been has been increasing rapidly since the flood, which is reasonable until probably about uh, two or three thousand years ago, um, then uh, you should be able to see that effect. And so it's a simple matter of, of doing carbon fourteen takes. I, I was just approaching this from the paleontological standpoint. Yeah. Not the carbon fourteen point standpoint, but uh, your point's well taken. Well, I suppose that uh, that ends it for now, and um, we will see you next week. And uh, let's see the the next. Uh, the next thing we'll be looking at is the human appendix and other so-called junk. And depending on how much time we have to spend on that, we may look at the human eye as well. So come back next week for more.